Welcome back to our weekly Bible study through the book of Matthew. Last week, we were in chapter 8, and this week, we are in the first 34 verses of chapter 9. But before we get into our study, like always, I have a few announcements for today. I can hardly believe it, but this week is Thanksgiving. I pray that you men will have a blessed Thanksgiving with your family and friends. The Thanksgiving holiday doesn't really affect BSF. We'll still be meeting the, on Monday following Thanksgiving. Next Monday, Jared will be providing the third BSF seminar we offer this year. The seminar subject is leading small group Bible studies. If you have wanted to know how to get started to lead a small group or Sunday school class, the seminar will help you to get the basics. Remember, the seminar is the Monday after Thanksgiving at 5.30 p.m. For you guys in our satellite groups, in our online groups, let me know if you want to participate in the seminar next Monday through YouTube live stream. Either let me know through the YouTube comments or let your group leader know. If we get an interest, we will live stream, but if not, we won't live stream. That's it for the announcements this week. Now let's uh, bow our heads and go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight desiring to hear from you. Use this study to grow our faith and challenge us where you desire to see change in our lives. Open our ears and hearts so we can have maximum intake of your truth. In Christ's powerful name, amen. As we get started tonight, I'm sure many, if not all of you guys, have heard the phrase, no pain, no gain. But is that really true? I would think most of us don't like pain or painful situations, but is there value in pain that we encounter in this life? Up on the screen is a quote from C.S. Lewis. Lewis was a 20th century theologian and the author of the Chronicles of Narnia. Well, you can read his quote, but essentially Lewis said, God uses pain to get the attention of a world too busy to listen to God. In fact, he used the metaphor of a megaphone when, when God is using pain in our lives to get our attention. Maybe many of you guys have firsthand experience with God's megaphone. I know God used pain in my marriage to cause me to seek God in a deeper deeper, more meaningful way. Well, in chapter nine, we'll see many people who were experiencing pain in their lives, physical or emotional pain, and how they desperately sought out Jesus to restore their lives. Through these miracles, we will see that Jesus didn't just come to relieve human suffering, but his miracles point to the fact that Jesus has authority over sin and death. Therefore, we'll be we will divide this week's passage in two divisions. Division one is Matthew chapter nine, verses one through 17, unexpected purpose. And our second division is Matthew chapter nine, verses 18 through 34, unexpected power. As we get started in division one, unexpected purpose, I just wanna mention that most Bible scholars say that chapters eight and nine should be studied as a single unit. Remember when Matthew wrote his gospel, there were no chapter breaks. Chapter eight reveals Jesus's authority over disease, his disciples, nature, and Satan. While chapter nine will continue to demonstrate Jesus's authority, but this time his authority over sin and death. Matthew in chapter nine is like opening a family album as he takes us from snapshot to snapshot of Jesus's ministry in the Galilee. These snapshots will tell us who Jesus is and what Jesus did and what he can do for you. Now, many of us who grew up going to Sunday school are mostly familiar with, with all these miracles that we will discuss today. And the BSF notes do a good job at discussing the miracles, but let's just try to take a step back and gain some perspective of these miracles that we might not have seen before. 
So if you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9, we will get started in verse 1. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralyzed man laying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Well, <clears throat> for the second time, Jesus and his disciples boarded the boat and set sail across the Sea of Galilee back to Capernaum. As you may recall from last week, the Gadareans asked Jesus to leave after, after all the pigs drowned when Jesus cast the demons from the two demon-possessed men and let them go into the nearby pigs. The Gadareans rejected Jesus's power and authority, but on the other side of the lake were a lot of people waiting in Capernaum for his return. The science, the, the, science, the scene switches from the boat to Jesus teaching in a house. Some believe it was Peter's house, but we don't know for sure. Now, according to Mark's account, there were four men who brought a paralyzed man to be healed. But when they got to the house, the house was completely full of people. Now, if you had half-hearted belief, what would you have done with a paralyzed man? You might have just dropped him off and left, but not these guys. These four men persevered in their faith by taking the man up to the rooftop and then lowering him down to Jesus. To go through this much trouble, it took 100% belief that Jesus could heal this man. Jesus recognized the faith of the four men, but then Jesus says something unexpectedly. He forgave the paralyzed man of his sins. Why would Jesus forgive this man's sins? In chapter eight's miracles and the rest of the miracles in chapter nine, Jesus doesn't announce that he forgives sins prior to performing the miracle. We don't know for sure, but potentially the man was more troubled by his sins standing before Jesus than he was about his physical limitations. What we do know is Jesus cares more about this man's spiritual well-being than his physical well-being. So Jesus healed the man of his greatest need, and that is forgiveness of sins, which happens to be our greatest need as well. You see, we are all like the paralyzed man, unable to pay our sin debt and thereby unable to redeem ourselves. Only Jesus can redeem us from our sinful state. Now, what do you suppose the four men on the roof were thinking? We don't know for sure, but they might have been thinking, no, heal his body. We brought him to be healed of his paralysis. The Bible doesn't reveal what the men were thinking, but we do know what the Pharisees were thinking. And that was Jesus was blaspheming. Only God can forgive sins. Now, if Jesus had only been a mere man, the Pharisees would have been right. But having the power and the authority to forgive sins telegraphs that Jesus is the God man. The text continues with Jesus' answer to the Pharisees in verse 5, saying, Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, and go home. Then the man got up and went home. Jesus wants us to clearly understand that he has the authority to forgive us. This is something only God can do. Our sins against God are a rejection of his authority, and only he can forgive that. It should have been sufficient that Jesus said it, but because Jesus has compassion on the man and desires for everyone in the crowd to understand that this man's sins have been forgiven, Jesus not only forgave the man of his sins, but Jesus completely healed his body. <clears throat> what did this man do to earn such favor from Jesus? This man didn't do anything to receive God's grace. If he had, it wouldn't be grace because grace is undeserved favor from God. We are helpless to earn God's grace. Grace is not earnable, but it is freely given. 
Now, verse 8 describes the reaction of the crowd. They were filled with awe and they praised God. When God reaches down to mankind and responds graciously to sinful man, all we can do is praise him and be amazed. Moving on to the next snapshot, we see the call of Matthew, starting in verse 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. In what was a profound moment in Matthew's life, he responded to Jesus' command obediently, which stands in stark contrast to chapter 8's would-be disciples who came to Jesus with preset conditions and their own agenda. Let's pause for a moment. What did it mean to be a tax collector in first century Roman world? We know that Jewish citizens hated tax collectors, but why was that? Well, tax collectors were essentially Israelites who acted for Rome as government agents who did the bidding for Rome. Rome exacted two major forms of taxation on its subjects. The first being an income or sales tax, very similar to what we have today. And the second being a customs tax on imports and exports. The second is the form of taxation that allowed for the greatest opportunity for unethical earnings. Tax collectors were also called publicans, which meant that they not only did, not only did they collect taxes, but they also bid on government contracts to provide needed supplies and housing to the Roman occupying army. Because of this fact, they were viewed as traitors since they helped the Roman army to sustain their occupation in Israel. No one wanted to be around Matthew except for other social outcasts and of course, Jesus. Matthew as a publican would have known the emotional pain and stigmatism of being banned from the synagogue, shunned by his countrymen, and numbered with other sinners. The emotional pain of being a tax collector might have been the reason why Matthew was so primed and ready when Jesus said, follow me. Jesus, Jesus' offer allowed Matthew to have a second chance. Jesus essentially was going to redeem Matthew from being a tax collector to being a disciple. But let's take an inward look at ourselves. When you came to Christ, did you also experience this second chance on life when you were made a new creation in Christ? Well, the scene changes from Matthew's tax booth to his home, where it appears Matthew is throwing a farewell party. And Matthew's fellow publicans and other social outcast friends came out to see what it means to be a follower of Jesus. In the crowd, standing outside of the house, was a group of unfriendly faces, Pharisees. And the Pharisees were trying to stir the pot by asking the question to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Have you ever heard the phrase, joy killers? Well, the phrase, well, the Pharisees were grace killers. In their self-righteous approach to religion, everything had to be earned. And in their eyes, the people who were at the party were too deep in sin to ever be anything other than a sinner. God's love didn't apply to these misfits. They were beyond redemption according to their narrow view. But Jesus responds to the Pharisees, starting in verse 12 through 13. On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus clarifies the wrong thinking of the Pharisees. By quoting an Old Testament verse they would have been familiar with, Hosea 6.6. 6. By doing this, Jesus turned the tables on the Pharisees by pointing out first that he was more than a teacher, 
but the true physician. And second, God cares more about compassion shown through grace, mercy, and love than sacrifices. The Pharisees had institutionalized shunning sinners and looking down upon them when really they were called to have compassion on them and to show them grace. This week's BSF doctrinal focus is God's grace. And like always, there's a highlighted section in the notes which defines the doctrine of grace. But I'd like to just say the following about grace. <clears throat> when you do not believe God is gracious, you see him as harsh and unloving because he expects from you what you cannot deliver. If salvation is not by grace, then you must earn favor with God, which will end in personal burnout and exhaustion because it's impossible to earn God's favor. But when you believe God is gracious and generous, you can approach God honestly and trust him completely because God's interaction with us is based upon his love and mercy towards us. God will not reject you because of your sin. Through Christ, God gives you an opportunity for redemption. Moving on to verse 14, we see that there was another unhappy group in the crowd. Then John's disciples came and asked him, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn when he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, then they will fast. Jesus is now confronted by John's disciples with a different kind of wrong thinking. Perhaps inspired by the Pharisees' question, John's disciples notice a dichotomy between how they acted and how Jesus' disciples acted. So they ask specifically about the practice of fasting. <clears throat> In the Mosaic Law, there was only one day for fasting, and that was on the Day of Atonement. But through the years, first century Judaism, tradition was to fast on Monday and Thursday. So this traditional bi-weekly fasting would have been very noticeable if Jesus and his disciples were not participating. And it would have caused some eyebrows to be raised. We would like to think that all of John's disciples immediately switched their allegiance to Jesus the Lamb of God, but clearly that wasn't the case. Whatever the reason, some of John's disciples were unwilling or not ready to turn to Jesus as the Messiah. But in the face of the questioning, Jesus responded graciously by gently showing them their thinking was wrong. And Jesus took this opportunity to teach them some theology as well. In verse 15, Jesus metaphorically refers to himself as the bridegroom and his disciples as the guest of the bridegroom. Once again, the BSF notes are excellent. There's a highlighted section discussing the implications of Jesus referring to himself as the bridegroom. But the bottom line is this. By this claim, Jesus once again was pointing out that he was, in fact, God. Using the passive verb taken, in verse 15, it revealed that his departure would be violent in nature. And it was the first hint to the disciples that Jesus would not always be with them. Jesus also used his teaching moment to introduce the coming of the new covenant. The old covenant had served its purpose, and now Jesus would be ushering in the new covenant. The point of the new cloth on old and new wine and old skins illustration is that Jesus didn't come to patch up first century Judaism. Jesus' teaching was superior and authoritative over the teaching of the Pharisees. Jesus also dropped hints of this new covenant to the woman at the well in John's gospel when he said, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Yet, Yet a time is coming and has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. 
for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. As much as we love hearing about physical healings, Jesus' primary purpose for coming to earth was to bring redemption to sinful man. Jesus, is, Jesus came to close out the age of the law and to introduce the age of grace. And to that we say, amen. Which brings us to our first principle. Jesus' purposeful authority redeems mankind. Jesus' purposeful authority redeems mankind. How important <clears throat> is it to you that Jesus came to redeem you from your old way of life? Like the desperate paralytic who needed forgiveness and healing and the unethical tax collector who needed redemption and restoration and a second chance. Jesus's true disciples understand that we are infected with a terminal disease called sin and guilt, which only can be cured by the great physician. Unfortunately, many people today are like the Pharisees and the scribes who operate under the gross misconception that they are just fine without Jesus in their lives. But what about you? How does forgiveness of sins empower you to make a difference in this life? Who do you need to faithfully bring before Jesus for spiritual healing? In the second division, we will see Jesus' unexpected power as the text shift shifts from theological metaphors to new life under Jesus' authority through practical examples. Verse 18 tells us that a synagogue leader is seeking Jesus because his daughter has died, and he believes that Jesus has power over death. From the other gospel accounts, we learn that his name is Jairus. This must have been awkward for Jairus because the rest of the Pharisees and his posse were starting to oppose Jesus. And here goes the leader of them asking Jesus to touch his dead daughter. What incredible faith to recognize Jesus' power and to intercede on the behalf of his daughter and to break ranks with the other Pharisees. Jesus and his disciples went with Jairus, but an unexpected touch occurred between Jesus and a woman who was suffering from a flow of blood for 12 years. Verse 21 states, she said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at the moment. This woman had been suffering for 12 years, richly unclean, unable to worship, an outcast of the community, and unable to have children. What a difficult and empty life she must have had for 12 years. From the other gospel account, we learn that she spent all her money on doctors who were unable to heal her. But it was this painful situation that allowed her to express her faith. Without this suffering in her life, she might not have come to believe in Jesus. So even though 12 years of suffering was painful, if it leads to eternity with Jesus in a perfect body, it was well worth it. Well, the group finally made it to Jairus' house where there were professional mourners making a bunch of noise. Jesus told the mourn mourners to get out because the girl was not dead, but only asleep. And while they scoffed and laughed at Jesus, the text tells us after the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. Both Jairus and the woman came to the feet of Jesus by faith that he was who he said he was. And he had the ability to give new life. Both Jairus' daughter and the woman were given new life in their community. Like the healing of the leper in chapter eight, touching a bleeding woman would have defiled Jesus and touching a dead body would have also made him unclean. But instead, Jesus' purifying power overcame the uncleanness of both and gave them new life. The natural, the, natu the, 
the natural direction was reversed. And the clean cleansed the unclean, as opposed to the unclean defiling the clean. But before we move on, we learned an important lesson from Jairus. When tragedy strikes your family, it is wise to go to Jesus. As Jesus moved on from there, he encountered two blind men asking from, for mercy from the son of David. This is the first time that Jesus is referred to as the son of David, which is another title for the Messiah. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah, and after Jesus confirmed their belief in him, verse 29 reads, Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. The blind men demonstrated faith by seeking Jesus out. But it makes you wonder if these men had never been blind, if they would have sought Jesus out. I'm sure the pain of being blind helped them to seek Jesus for healing, but it also allowed them to hear what Jesus was saying better than people who had sight. It's interesting to note in the Old Testament, there are no sight restoration miracles. And in the New Testament, there are none outside of the Gospels. But restoring sight is the most common miracle performed by Jesus. Healing the blind is not only fulfillment of messianic prophecy, but physical blindness is symbolic of, some, of spiritual blindness. And it's only Jesus who has the power and the authority to heal spiritual blindness. Well, in our final snapshot of the night, we're going to see Jesus' power over the demonic realm and the beginning of the rise of the opposition from the Pharisees. Shortly thereafter, <clears throat> a man made mute by a demon was brought to Jesus. As a side note, there was a lot of demon activity during Jesus' earthly ministry. Matthew described the scene this way, starting in verse 32. While they were Going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. The crowd's amazement and acknowledgement must have been difficult for the Pharisees to hear. But not everyone was on board with Jesus. You would have thought the Pharisees would have been happy to see all the miracles, but they weren't. However, the religious crowd was no longer able to deny Jesus's power. So instead, they questioned the source of his power. Verse 34 records that the Pharisees rejected Jesus's deity and instead slandered him by saying, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. Last week, we discussed demons and spiritual warfare for the believer. This week, we need to answer the question, who is the prince of demons? Well, the short answer is Satan, but there is a little more to it than that. Later on in Matthew in chapter 12, Jesus says the prince of demons is Beelzebul. So who is Beelzebul? Or how, can, or how did Satan get this title or name? If you recall, the promised land was in the land of Canaan. The ancient Canaanites were evil and wicked people who God used the Israelites to destroy them. However, the Israelites frequently throughout their history would fall into idolatry with the Canaanite gods. Well, the Canaanite god of death was named Moat. Moat was the lord of the underworld and the Canaanite and in the Canaanite pantheon, Moat was a powerful god. Moat would consume lesser gods and men. Coming up in a few more chapters, Jesus will make a reference to the realm of the underworld. The Semitic word for the Canaanite storm god was Biel. The Greek transliteration of Biel is Baal, which is how we most commonly see it in, in our Bible. Moat and Biel fought over rulership, and initially it looks like Moat killed Biel, but Biel comes back to life and conquers Moat. 
So in doing so, Biel becomes the Lord of the underworld. Some might say Lord of the flies, but Prince of the Dead is more accurate, which is Beelzebul. In the New Testament, Baal was the ruler of the gods, which the gods are demons, and the ruler of the demons is Satan. So with all that, just to say, Satan is the prince of the demons. But the important thing is to have faith in the fact that Jesus has complete authority over heaven and earth, and life and death. Jesus has conquered death and is the sovereign ruler over Satan. Jesus restores and brings new life. Jesus is the God-man of new life and not of death. Which brings us to our second principle. Jesus's powerful authority restores new life. Jesus's powerful authority restores new life. So far in our study of Matthew, we've, we have seen that Strong faith is often found in strange places. The two blind men saw more clearly than those with sight. A deaf person heard. The bleeding woman and desperate father knew where to go. The purpose of the miracles is not the healing, but the focus on the healer. The point is the person, not the miracle, who we know as son of David, son of man, the son of God, and finally, as the Messiah. So let me ask you, how does your life show that you rejoice more over spiritual health than physical health? What evidence of new life in you does the world see? In summary of the passage, in the beginning, I asked the question, is there any value in pain? Well, if your suffering and pain leads you to the great physician, then there is tremendous value. If you deny your need for the great physician, then the value in your pain is for others to witness what not to do. <clears throat> Only Jesus has authority to set people free from sin and death. So the takeaway tonight is Jesus is no mere man. He was and is God. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are broken men who understand the depth of our sins and your forgiveness. We're thankful that Jesus came not just to heal us physically and emotionally, but came to heal us spiritually. Your love for fallen man is great. Give us the courage over the Thanksgiving weekend to be the salt and light to those who need your healing. In Christ's name, amen.